speakers are going to start momentarily. Fall 2019 UNM Press authors Jack Leffer and Barbara Rockman will present their new books and describe their experiences writing and sub subsequently publishing these remarkable new titles with UNM He. These are their bios. Elise McHugh is an acquisition editor at the University of New Mexico Press. She acquires in many fields including poetry, fiction, memoir, photography, and art, fine art, and criticism, and liter literary and popular culture studies criticism. Her experience in publishing includes 13 years at UNM Press and eight years at West End Press, as well as literary and scholarly journals. Bryce Emily is the author of Prose Chapbooks, a brief family Hello. Okay. A brief family history of drowning and smoke and glass. He works as a marketing associate at the University of New Mexico Press, where he coordinates events and exhibits and is also poetry editor of Raleigh Review. Jack Leffler is an oral historian, is that how I say that? Environmentalist, writer, radio producer, and sound collage artist. He is the author of <laughs> He is the author of many books, including Thinking Like a Watershed, Voices from the West, Survival Along the Continental Divide, an anthology of interviews and adventures with Ed, a portrait of Abby, all from the UNM Press, Barbara Rockman, is the author of Sting and Nest Poems, winners of the New Mexico Arizona Book Award. She teaches writing at Santa Fe Community College and at Esperanza Shelter for Battered Families. Raised in Western Massachusetts, she now lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Please give them all a round of applause. Well, thank you. It's really nice to be here. It's always fun to get to be the one to break the ice. <laughs> uh, so my name is Elise McHugh. I am with the University of New Mexico Press, and I'm happy to say that we are celebrating this year our 90th anniversary. Thank you. So we were founded in 1929 um, as a university press primarily um, focused on scholarly books, but we quickly decided that um, we also wanted to support regional publications in the regional life of the country. And so we started splitting our time, splitting our efforts to publishing both scholarly and trade. And so at this point in our publishing life, we are publishing about half trade and half scholarly. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, in terms of our trade list, um, we do a variety of different things. Uh, we do hiking guides and field guides. Uh, we do popular history and culture. Uh, we've done biography, memoir, some autobiography. We do some fiction. We do some poetry. Uh, there's quite a number of, of things, as well as, as fine art and photography, um, which we've been known for. So there's a wide range of things that, that we acquire. 
Um, in terms of what we're looking at right now, we do about four poetry books each year, thanks to an endowment we have, uh, the Mary Bird Christians and Poetry Endowment, which is what enabled us to publish uh, Barber's book. Um, I would say that a lot of what we're looking for now, at least something that I'm very interested in, is nonfiction of a variety of sorts that is looking at the environment. Um, it continues to be something that's important. Uh, it continues to be something that is continuing. It's, it's becoming more and more a complex and important issue in the country. And I think that that's something that we're looking at from a variety of angles, both scholarly and trade, in terms of memoir, in terms of, uh, in terms of popular history or culture, um, in looking at that books of essays that take on the environment from a variety of perspectives. In terms of uh, fiction, um, when I look at fiction, it's both plot and character driven. I love characters. I love characters even if I don't love characters. I don't have to love them in order to enjoy the book. So when I look at fiction, a lot of what I'm doing is I'm looking at, at the character driven and seeing if the plot hangs together with the characters. And right now, what we're interested in doing in part is looking at some edgier fiction along with traditional fiction. Um, things that can, can look at the anti-hero, uh, things that are more noir, sort of a border noir take on, on, the, on the larger U.S. West. Um, and that opens up, what I like about that is it opens us up to doing everything from sort of Cormac McCarthy fiction um, to something that's more like Stephen Graham Jones, who has uh, werewolves wandering around in the middle of Lubbock, or giant uh, nuclear rabbits heading out to Del Rio. You know, things like that. So sort of some editor fictions, some of the stuff that we are, are looking at currently. Um, but we're doing about 50 books a year, so we do about 25 trade books from a variety of perspectives. And um, I'm going to pass it on now. I know that's just a very brief overview, but I'm going to pass it down the line because I'd like to make sure that we open up for questions. Um, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions because I'm sure there's things that I'm not saying that you'd like to know about. So we'll come back to me. Hi, I am the marketing associate, Bryce Emily. Uh, I am also the events coordinator for UNM Press. So um, most of what I have perspective on is not the, uh, uh, the acquisition of books, but sort of the, the next step after acquisitions what happens after a book gets selected for publication and then comes out. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different approaches to marketing books and for trade books, what we tend to do is uh, try to market them with events is one of our biggest ways to get the word out about a book. Um, there is a wash of books every single year. If you want to read a new novel, you can read thousands and thousands of new novels every single year. So uh, getting your attention is not the easiest thing to do as a publisher um, in such a crowded field. So especially for a press like UN Press, who, who has a commitment to not necessarily just regional authors, but regional interests and um, subjects and topics that are important to our region, as Lee said, uh, the environment being one of them. Um, water rights are huge out here. and. Uh, we see in the Southwest, the environment is something we have to pay a lot of attention to, um, more so than other parts of the country. So um, the topics that are important to our region, and so that often means that our authors are in New or around New Mexico, um, as you can see, there's a couple. Um, and so we have our strongest relationships with uh, places that are around Albuquerque and Santa Fe. We do a lot of our events with book works and collective works um, and libraries. So we, and we're always looking at places that are a little bit uh, more off the beaten path than uh, just bookstores. Um, bookstores are the heart and soul, independent uh, publishing sales in a lot of ways. And, um, uh, but they're not the only place to do everything. They're not the only place to draw attention. So um, from our perspective, we like to see authors and, and books that are able to reach interests more than just uh, like subject-wise interest more than just a literary interest because um, a bookstore is great, but also if your book is about, let's say, water rights, then um, reading in a bookstore is one thing, but also there are societies and groups 
um, that, are, that have environmental interests that are not just literary types, but um, uh, groups of scholars, groups of independent scholars. Um, so like, like I said, we like to do a lot of public libraries, um, bringing access to the community to lots of places that uh, aren't just the usual bookstore. Um, so other things that we do are we will create things like bookmarks or postcards and physical, we call it collateral. Um, we do take out ads in some of the bigger trade publicity magazines. Um, we have presences at lots of different uh, conferences. Um, Elise has just done a couple, for instance. Um, we don't, we can't go to every conference. Um, we have to sort of weigh pros and cons of, of the budgets of doing all of them. So, but we do go to roughly 20-ish per year. Um, and we have multiple editors who go to different ones. Um, so bringing our books there and um, showing them to the world, showing them to scholars and, and writers and, and readers who are interested in those things. Um, and then being able, at least for the press, being present to talk to prospective authors at those conferences are some ways that uh, we also bring in new authors. So um, lots of these place-based approaches to marketing. Um, and we also expect, a, we also expect our authors to have a strong part in the marketing process. And this isn't a new concept. Um, I mean, maybe back in the uh, former days of glory where you could be Ernest Hemingway and just publish a book and everybody would buy it because of your name. Um, we, for a long time now, it's, it's been expected that authors will also have some sort of a stake in marketing the books. So having the um, willingness and ability to go out and do these readings um, some of our authors go to conferences, some don't, um, and those can be helpful. And um, reaching out within their own communities and, and tapping any kind of group they have. This network here is actually a great example of one, um, and some, something that I'm sure many of you have experienced yourself, having your own communities uh, of, and networks of people to talk to about your book and to share it and then have them share it as well. Um, that's great. So I mean, we love seeing authors who are tapped into uh, communities and organizations like this one. So um, the the book publicity process is an ongoing one. It starts before the book comes out, and it continues after it's published, and um, goes on basically for as long as the author is willing to uh, to carry it. So um, we, we try to support that as much as we can. Um, also, with the knowledge that we do publish 50 books a year, so um, we give as much attention as we possibly can to every author. Um, but uh, we, we do get a lot out of uh, the author's efforts as well. So um, I will be able to answer any other questions that I didn't cover on what our basic responsibilities are. Uh, if anybody has questions, we we'll open it up about what goes into our book. So I'm going to pass it over to our poet of the day, Barbara Rock. Thanks. Um, I just have to say that it's been a real pleasure to work with uh, UNM Press. I, um, I have one other book of poetry that came out a number of years ago with a small regional press, and the difference, as Bryce is mentioning, about uh, this collaboration between the writer and the press has been amazing. I mean, I have, um, I think I've done 15 readings since July for this book to Cleve. And I've organized a lot of that, and, and yet the press has also publicized it, helped me network with um, <coughs> bookstores and reading series. So um, just a little bit about how this book came into being in terms of um, the time frame. I probably spent six or seven years messing around with this group of poems and reorganizing them and showing them to different people I admire. And in 2016, I was invited by uh, Hilda Raz, the uh, editor of the poetry series, to submit a manuscript. So from 2016 to 2019 was a process of uh, the book being looked at by the external reviewers which is an interesting aspect of a university press that you don't get with a typical literary press, which actually I found really supportive and insightful to have these two external reviewers give me input before 
the uh, draft of the manuscript actually went, started its process before I signed a contract and it went to the copy editor and so on. But um, it's been a team effort and I would say that has been the, the highlight of the experience for me, working with a terrific copy editor. Elise and Bryce are amazing. There's other people at the press who've all jumped in in different ways. And um, that feeling of being supported, um, at, you know, when we're these solitary writers who sit in our rooms, and especially poets who tend to be in some ethereal other realm a lot of the time. Um, to, be, to be shored up and supported by a press like UNM has been a real joy. So, um, I mean, here's the book. They did a gorgeous, gorgeous job. Um, worked with me on the cover, which is a, a painting by an artist from Woodstock, New York, who happens to be a friend. But the fact that um, it was a give and take throughout, I would say, um, has been pretty terrific. So um, that's my little piece, and I'll hand it over to Jack. Thank you, Barbara. Well, first of all, I'm very honored to be here among you folks. This is really a joy for me. And secondly, I want to ask a question. I'm, well, I'll preface it. I'm 83 years old. Is there anybody in the room older than me? Happiness <laughs> <laughs> is mine. Now, the reason I ask that is that I came to writing kind of late. My first book didn't come out until I was 53, about 30 years ago. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I was very fortunate because I'd started out, well, I started out as a jazz musician back in the 50s. Wow. Back in the day. I used to play jazz poetry, as a matter of fact. Matter of fact, I did one jazz poetry thing with Joy Harjo and John Brandy. Uh, I never it was a long time ago, but the upshot is, is that uh, I got into writing, I suppose, when I first started keeping journals, starting close to 60 years ago. And uh, but I never thought to become a writer, a published writer. But I did get into radio production, and so what I would do is travel around with my tape recorder, now a digital recorder. Tape recorder is totally okay just like me, but the upshot is, is that I traveled all over the place looking for people who had fascinating things to say. And that included people from, well, first of all, I like to start with, uh, I did about, I recorded about 4,000 Hispano folk songs that uh, really fascinated me. Being an old jazz musician, it's easy to slip into ethnomusicology. And that actually turned into my first book with UNM Press entitled La Música de los Viejitos. And it also includes a three CD set of 93 songs collected by me that represent the 52 or so uh, musical forms that I was able to identify. And I think, according to my friend Beth Havis, that may have been the first time sound was included with a book uh, at UNM Press. And that book came out in 1999. And that was fun. But the upshot is, is that the more and more I traveled around with the tape recorder producing radio programs that were uh, public, well, they were broadcast over community public and national public radio systems throughout the country. Uh, the more I got into thinking, boy, this is a fantastic joint medium, recording and writing. One thing I'd like to say off the top of Barbara is that I've had the great good fortune to record some poets reading their own works. And when you read a poem and hear the author read that poem at the same time, it takes you about 10 miles deeper into it. Uh, right now I'm working on uh, a small anthology, two of them. One with Will Roth, a good friend of many years. The other with John Brandy, another good friend of many years. But I did one once with one of my favorite poets of all time, a man named Philip Wayman, one of the great beat poets. 
And then I've done uh, four books, actually, with another great poet who doesn't think of himself as a big poet. His name is Gary Snyder, and it's really been fun because you listen to it through the headphones, you read it at the same time, and then you get to uh, shoot the breeze between poems, and sometimes that's the most revealing thing of all. <laughs> anyway, that being said, uh, much of what I've really focused on is the relationship of culture to habitat, whether it be monoculture that we are all spawned within these days, or indigenous cultures. This, this opened up my eyes to a bunch of things. Back in 1964, I lived in a fork stick hogan up in Navajo Mountain, Utah. And it was there, living in the remotest part of the Navajo Reservation, that it actually became totally apparent to me how much indigenous culture is shaped by habitat. And over the years, I've recorded Native American peoples. I won't call them Indians. I've been pointed out by my friend Jim Christoffek, who has some beautiful books out with you in press, that uh, Indians was Christopher Columbus's uh, sense of who he was looking at here and what he thought was the West Indies. But these people come from so many different cultures and so many different linguistic persuasions, the most interesting of which to me is the Seri Indian culture down in Sonora, Mexico, with whom I've lived for weeks, months of my life. Their language is its own final, which means that it's related to no other known language. And boy, when you think about that, and I'm a bit old now to try to trace where they may have come from, but the way that would be obvious to me if I were about even, I would be 80 again. You know, <laughs> is to actually try to trace their origins through their folk music and their lore. I've done this with so many different Native American tribes at this point. And the one thing that has really revealed itself big time to me is that I've yet to meet a traditional indigenous person who does not regard their habitat as sacred where in our culture, we have had the proclivity to secularize habitat, to turn it into money. And so that's basically what my last book, or the most recent book at least, could be my last book, what the heck. Uh, it started out as a memoir, and then I realized that I was getting tired of writing just about me. So part two of that book actually gets into trying to reveal a bunch of perspectives from many of the people that I've interviewed over the years. The name of the book, it's called Headed Into the Wind. And my first book, which came out a long time ago, was called Headed Upstream. So I figured I was always headed somewhere where it was tougher to get to than if you were going downstream. That's the point of it, is to really get into it on a way where you're challenging yourself as much as you're being challenged by the habitat itself. But finally, and I'll keep this very brief, much of the point of this latest book is that we indeed are looking at environmental crises, climate crises, global crises, that are really enormous and that we are being blindsided to the enormity of these crises by virtue of the system of attitudes that we maintain within our entire monocultural perspective. And it seems to me, after having thought about this a long time, that before we're really going to address sufficiently this whole business of global warming and climate instability, we're going to have to invoke a whole shift of cultural attitude, attitudes right here within our own culture. And so that's what my book is basically about. And as soon as I'm off the book tour that I'm going to finish up this coming week, I'm going to start on a new re radio series that's tentatively entitled, and this is way too long a title, I'll have to shorten it, 
reseeding the commons of human consciousness with indigenous mindedness. And that may turn into a book itself, who knows. But in the meantime, thank you so much for allowing us to come up here today and speak to you. Thank you. questions, um, I'll pass it at least. Um, and I wanted to say briefly that I think that um, Jack's work is indicative of what UN Impress and publishers like UN Impress, especially university presses, um, are able to do, which is take uh, things that seem very uh, localized and regional interests um, and show how they actually expand to be global interests and global uh, uh, concerns. And so um, books that seem like they're based on a local regions actually show that they are um, relevant everywhere. Um, and so lots of big trade pub uh, trade houses won't publish books like that, um, don't have the space for them. But that's where uh, presses like UN Press are able to um, do that important work. Um, Can I say what I was I would also like to say that I don't write to make money. <laughs> that's not the point of it all. I had forgotten to preface this whole thing by saying the most effective means of creative writing I have ever endeavored to pursue is learning how to write a good grant proposal. there's marketing, there's acquisitions, we're one part of it. And university presses are one part of what I'm happy to say is a thriving ecosystem of publishing throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, I, I share, you know, you know that there are a variety of different ways to publish, including self-publishing, um, what I call the, you know, the micro presses that are really just one person dedicated to putting out some books to literary houses of all sorts, both for-profit and non-for-profit, university presses, and then the large houses, which are, well, there are five that have about, amongst them, about 900 imprints. You'd be surprised with some of the publishers you might look at and say, oh, that person, and then you look at it and you'll realize it's actually part of Random House, Penguin Random House, it's an imprint of them. So we are part of a very large ecosystem, but Bryce is absolutely correct. One of the reasons that a lot of university presses um, branched from doing scholarly publishing only into the trade publishing of all sorts was because we could pick up and support books that we thought were wonderfully written, extremely important, very creative, that those larger houses wouldn't pick up because they are too regional. Because one of the things we understand is that while well, everything is based in a place it has the universal qualities, and that's something that we look for, is something that's based in the region. Um, when I made that crack like about Stephen Graham Jones and, the, and the, 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 the vampire bunny from Del Rio, one of the things that's interesting about that book is because he set this horror scene directly in Texas. Um, but it has these universal themes that are of interest to a lot of people, and that's where these come in, and we have the ability to support projects that are based within a region and that need to be read and need to be seen, um, but that would be overlooked. And that's where a lot of the micro presses come in, that's where a lot of the literary houses come in. Um, and for us, um, we look for different projects. We have guidelines on our uh, website. Most presses will have guidelines on their website. Um, we usually look for a proposal and a query letter and then some sample chapters. And depending on the, on the press that you're looking at when you're doing your research, um, that's a good place to start, is to find out on the website what they're looking for. Um, but I do want to uh, also say, this is something that I say to my authors uh, before they ever meet Bryce and the rest of the team, these days you are your own best marketer. And unless you are Stephen King or someone 
uh, or uh, William Faulkner, uh, Ernest Hemingway, I think is the one you used. Uh, it, it, you really are going to have to be the point person, partially because um, you know the book better than anyone else, and, um, and partially because last, you know, in the past couple of years, 1.5 million new books were published in the U.S. alone, and that doesn't count the e-books. So, um, trying to get out there, in particular fiction and some of the other genres, but in particular fiction, but memoir, poetry, there's a lot of competition. So, finding any way to help yourself stand out. And um, depending on the, uh, the publisher that you're working with, they may or they may not have a large budget um, or a large team. And um, so, when you're looking for a publisher, I'm just going to mention that one of the things you can think about talking about with the editor. Um, even before you sign the contract, is you know it's okay to have those conversations to say what kind of what kind of marketing goes into this and and um, and and what do you expect of me? You know, having those conversations up front um, so that you can start getting an idea about um, uh, whether it's going to be um, you and the publisher or maybe they are a very small team and they're going to do a beautiful job with your book. They're going to get it into bookstores, but they're not going to have the kind of uh, personnel to be able to really um, market the book. That might be on you, and that doesn't mean that it's bad, it just means that you need to be aware of that going in. But even if you have an entire team, we have, we were lucky, we have three people. Uh, Bryce, um, uh, Catherine uh, White, who's our marketing and sales manager, Adeoga Hume, who is our publicist. Um, we've got a fairly large team, but still with 50 books. We try to give as much attention to every book as we can. Um, and, and you might have, again, but even if you have a large team of like 20 people and they actually have a budget, uh, more of a budget, you're still going to need to be the person that pushes that book because you're going to be able to reach places that they can't. So, um, with that, I, I think we should just open it up to questions because I know, okay, yeah. So before we start with questions, because there's one microphone for people and a big room, if you're going to ask a question, could you please stand up and ask the question and let us know who you're asking the question to, because that will help our panel. Okay? Stand up, ask the question, who is it going to? Here already. Yeah. Uh, this is for Bryce and, and Elise. Um, could you reflect a bit from the point of view of the University Press on the future of brick and mortar? stores and specifically independent brick and mortar. If there's any thoughts about what your, the press's long-term plans are vis-a-vis -vis that segment of the market. I love brick and mortar stores. I haven't been to one of the Amazon brick and mortar stores, but I've heard that they're not all that great. But I don't know, I haven't been to one, but I love brick and mortar stores. Um, I've been hearing good news about some of those. I think it's still, um, and, and Bryce can speak to this even better than I can, but I think that people really still do enjoy their brick and mortar stores, and I think that that's going to continue um, to be part of who we place books with. Uh, certainly, a place where we continue to have um, marketing and, and, and reading effort stores. Um, the, the tough thing with, with brick and mortar stores is the fact that even the largest, even Barnes and Noble, can keep maybe. 500 titles at the tops in their store at any one time. And so it can be tough to get into the book, to, to the brick and mortar store sometimes, even though the books will be ordered. But in terms of the future brick and mortar, um, despite the crises we've seen with, with, um, with uh, uh, Barnes and Noble having some struggles and other places having struggles, I think that they will continue to be. Um, and uh, I think that as long as they continue to be, we'll continue to be. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I have been to a, uh, an Amazon bookstore, and it is weird. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like a physical algorithm. Um, and, you know, there's a, you know, there's a Handmaid's Tale, and then next to it there's a sign that's like, if you like this, you may like, and then it's like, you know, another book that an algorithm told them should go next to that book. And then, uh, it, there's, at a, uh, there's like books, and then below it has like an Amazon review from like a random person. Or like this, this book got five stars from 3,000 people. Uh, anyway, it's weird. It's, it's just like shopping on Amazon, but in person. Um, 
And, uh, but I think that it does sort of clue us into a little bit of the future of brick and mortar, which is um, that if Amazon and Jeff Bezos are deciding that there's profit to be made there, then there's probably still profit to be made there in some degree. Um, uh, he's not one to lose money. And uh, so, I mean, that's, there, maybe there's some clue there, but, um, and I think that uh, we will always love to run on brick and mortar, and I think everybody here can agree that we all love physical books, and we all um, love to go and browse bookstores. And uh, I think an important thing to note is if you want, as an author, if you want your local indie bookstores to support you, you also have to support them. Um, so go into readings and buying books from other authors whenever you see them there, um, choosing to buy locally whenever you can. Um, I know buying new books as opposed to used books, especially whenever Amazon will just at random discount them like 30%. Um, we don't have control of that, it just happens. Um, to even, even our books. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, it's a hard choice to make, but and not everyone is able to do that, but you when know, you can, support your, your local resources. One thing that strikes me about the Amazon approach is that more and more artificial intelligence is going to become the reader of our books. And so, are we going to be writing for robots, or are we going to be writing for ourselves? Uh, I just want to chime in here also, since I've been doing so many readings, um, there are reading series all over the country, and I would just say that um, my sense is that as a teacher who's done workshops in various places, and um, I have a pretty huge national network because I've gone to a lot of conferences over you know, the last 18, 19 years that I've been a serious writer. Um, people are buying my book in surprising ways. Um, people that I met at a conference 10 years ago are popping up and saying, I'm excited about this, I'm buying five and giving them to my cousins. So um, it's just an interesting project to get out there and try to market your book and sometimes in reading you'll sell two books and sometimes you'll sell 30 and, um, but there's something being built in that there's a community being built as you go out and share your work and especially poetry, this little tiny, you know, one, what is, I don't know, the percentage of people who read poetry in this country is tiny, but, um, there's something political in the act of getting out there and sharing what you love. And my book is, I think, a universal book that was published by a regional press. But the themes in this book of uh, faith and loss and disintegrating marriage and motherhood and um, the cultural moment that we're um, just trying to figure out those are themes that go vastly past the Southwest, and, and yet the images in my poems and the locations of many of my poems might be Cochiti Lake or Santa Fe River, but um, I'm just grateful that UNM has saw that, that the book has some universal appeal. So, um, I don't know, I guess I just want to say have faith in your own work because there is an audience for it and uh, I deeply believe that. Networking is our friend. Even if we don't like doing it, networking is our friend. <laughs> um, I, yeah, oh, okay. Um, hi. Um, in 2016, I sent a query to UNM Press <coughs> I received a phone call a couple of days later um, from a woman saying that um, UNM Press had had a problem with a Vietnam veterans book who turned out not to be a Vietnam veteran and they weren't going to look at any books by Vietnam veterans. Um, is that still true? Um, from the look on my face, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, I don't know who you spoke with, um, but no. <laughs> Uh, no, we would, we would, we've looked at, we've done books by veterans of all sorts. Um, and um, if someone has misrepresented themselves, that's unfortunate, but that doesn't mean that you don't take a look at 
other books by other people based on one experience. I'm a volunteer with 350 New Mexico, which um, is working to bring about the change in the people in the United States um, so that there's a, an urgent concern about climate change. Maybe you've heard about Phil McKibben. So 350 New Mexico is the local branch of 350 International. And what you were saying just sounds so much like um, what we're trying to do. And I wondered if you are working with any groups that are doing this. The issue in question had to do with 360 and Bill McKibben, and uh, if I'm working with any groups that are affiliated with that. Um, I'm not working specifically with that, but what I am doing, uh, how to put it, I go anywhere anybody wants me to talk. And what I do is I rant and rave and carry on, and I try to point out that our whole cultural perspective is dominated by an economically driven paradigm. And that until we shift out of that into an ecologically conscious level of cultural awareness, we're out of here. I mean, we're really eminently on the edge. And uh, I don't know Bill McKibben, but I've worked closely with a lot of hardcore environmentalists. As a matter of fact, one of the things I've tried to point out in a recent exhibition I co-curated up at the New Mexico History Museum at the Palace of the Governors focused on the history, it's entitled Voices of Counterculture in the Southwest. And what I tried to point out in that was counterculture, which really started happening big time, at least from my perspective, back in the, the 1950s. And what was to become the radical environmental movement which really started to hit back in the 1960s. Actually, early 60s with Rachel Carson's book. Um, Sign in Spring, yes. Actually, there was a series of books that came out. Another one was The Quiet Crisis by Stuart Udall. Another was The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. And to me, the most critical book of all came out in 1968, and that title is Desert Solitaire, yes. written by Edward Abbey, who was, happened to be my best pal in this lifetime. But the upshot is, is what I tried to point out, and I think this is so important right now in this cultural moment, is that the genesis of the radical environmental movement and the genesis of the most recent wave of counterculture occurred concurrently. And two of the greatest thinkers from that period were Edward Abbey, with regard to becoming really the godfather of the radical environmental movement, and Gary Snyder, who was very much the godfather of the counterculture movement. They never met. They were fellow anarchists. They had enormous respect for each other. And unfortunately, well, the three of us were going to go run the San Juan, but end up and die. So there you have it. But to me, it's so important to see that there's an historic context that precedes 360 that is really hardcore. It goes back, I think, if you look at the last two centuries, the 19th century, we had Thoreau, John Muir, Aldo Leo, he was born in the 1900s, 1800s, and also uh, John Wesley Powell. And those four guys, it turns out it's mostly guys remembered for this. I'm sure there were many women involved in this too, but they set four cornerstones, and that got trans, I won't say transmogrified, it turned into people like Martin Litton and Dave Brower, who were really great, as was Stuart Udall. I had the honor of spending a lot of time with Stuart. His wife was my last boss exactly 50 years ago. I've been without a job all of these years. But the <laughs> upshot is, is that looking at these different perspectives and how they weave together, and then the realization that Ed put down in that book, Set Desert Solitaire, was so profound that it set a whole new table from which people like Bill McKibben 
others like uh, Bill Weese is a fine writer who has really been working his book, The Great Eridness, is a fantastic book. By the way, UNM Press has published some of Bill's books. Bill is a real thinker, but these are the people, Gary Paul Manhattan is another one, people whose concepts have woven together in a fabric that is so vital right now, but man, we've got to get it, all of us into a certain new headset when we're out of here. No, we, we don't have a specific reading, per uh, reading period. Uh, some presses do. We are open at all times uh, for, for queries. Yeah. Uh, hold on one moment. It, uh, uh, right, right, this gentleman was first, and then right after him is you, I promise. I wonder, typically, how much do you invest in each title to meet your goal or budget? Uh, you mean in terms of money? How? Oh, uh, that, uh, 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 oh, I mean, it, in some ways it depends a little bit on, on the book. There's, because we do publish books that are, you know, a $95 monograph that has very important scholarly value that is going to be mostly made available in libraries and uh, academic libraries and people will check those out or they will find them digitally through various scholarly services, um, but most people aren't going to go to a bookstore and buy a $95 monograph that has footnotes and lots of jargon in it. Um, unless you're also a scholar and you're writing your own book, that will also be a $95 monograph. Um, and so, I mean, we, we invest our resources for that in a different way. With those kinds of scholarly books, we, we invest in making sure they get in the hands of libraries and academic institutions um, and that is that takes less time and, and monetary resource than, say, uh, another book that we are going to create arcs for, um, advanced review copies, um, and we do very few uh, of our titles will get that kind of a treatment. But, um, yeah, it's, it really depends on, on the subject of the book, the market of the book, and um, the sort of reach and scope of the book. And, um, and also, to some degree, the uh, capability or willingness of the author to engage in this as well. And uh, because if an author is very active in promoting the book, and they're out there and they're peddling it every day, and they're out selling it at conferences, and you know we have to reprint their book because they're selling a bunch of copies, and uh, you know they're going out and putting their feet on the pavement and handing out postcards and and getting the word out, then we're we're going to also sort of meet them to some degree where they are uh, and, and invest a little bit more in the book that the author is, is really putting out there. So, um, yeah, the resources that we invest depend a little bit on, on a lot of different factors, but um, but we, I mean, no book goes unnoticed by us. We, we, we're a small team, our marketing team is three people, and we publish 50 books a year, so I mean, we, we yeah, and we have, and we have, constant, we have a backlist. Every year we, we have a bigger backlist. Uh, you know, and so we don't want to forget about those books either. So you know, we do as much as we can for every book. Yeah, and when, when he's talking about those monographs, I mean, we, we, when our scholarly list: history, Latin American studies, Native studies, Chicano studies, uh, U.S. Western history, anthropology, and archaeology. So the market for um, a book on shell mounds from a very specific dig in southeastern Arizona is very small. <laughs> It's very different market from 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 an all, or and that's and so yeah, so so it's uh, different types of marketing that we do because that market's very small. You had a question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here, for one. And um, I wondered if you could describe the process and the, the sort of the timeline. So someone sends in a query and the process that then ends up bringing authors to the stage. Absolutely. Um, so. First, when I, when I receive a proposal, it'll be a, a proposal, a query letter, a proposal, sample chapters. Um, when I, if I think that the project's strong, it's a good fit for us, I think it'll do well on the list, I'll invite the full manuscript in. Usually the first thing that I do is take a look at the full manuscript and decide, yes, I think this really has 
um, marketability, and I talk with other members of the staff, including marketing and folks, on what we think we could do with the book and if it would do well on our list. University presses are a little bit different from other uh, literary presses. Um, uh, Barbara mentioned the uh, process. University presses, because we were started as um, scholarly presses, we do um, something called peer review, which is that we send all of the books out, whether they're scholarly or trade, um, out to two reviewers who are considered experts in that field. So if it's fiction, it's other fiction writers, poets, it's other poets. Um, if, it's, if it's a manuscript on 19th century uh, uh, Brazil, it's two people who focus on Brazil. And that allows us to get additional feedback. And those reviewers do everything from say, you know, this project is ready, it doesn't need a lot of revision to, it needs some revision, but it's ready to, we don't think it's ready. Um, it might be at some point, but it needs revision. Um, now, if we sent it out for review and the reviews come back and um, the reviewers think it's strong and we think it's strong, we take it to our university press committee, which is made up of faculty um, at various, uh, from various departments. That's the other thing that sets us apart from literary publishers, as well as to the staff, and we get approval to publish and we offer a contract. Um, generally, that process, it depends on how quickly the project is ready to go. If, if the project is ready to go, it just flies through that process. It'll take probably four to six months. It takes us sometimes when we have a backlog to get through the submissions, and then it takes about eight weeks uh, for that review process. They get uh, the, the reviewers get eight weeks to do those reviews. So it's anywhere from like four to six months, probably, to get to that point. Um, and then it just depends on how much revision that book needs. Um, if it's a book that we think is strong, um, once we sign a contract, we're going to talk to the author about any revisions they need to make. And they might turn those around in two weeks. They might turn them around in four months. Um, and then we can start looking at a publication schedule. Um, we generally, our books come out 18 to 24 months after um, they've been under contract. Um, for a variety of reasons. One is that we're doing 50 books and we've only got so many slots each year. So sometimes if we've already got, say, poetry books in the hopper um, and maybe we've already got a season filled, it's going to have to go, that, that book that's come in after those is going to have to go into the next season. So we kind of have to build in terms of the subject matter. But it's usually, well, I should say between 12 and 24 months that it will come out after it's been contracted. Um, and that is, uh, in large part, how complicated it is. If it's straight text, if it's tables, if it's photographs, it has to be printed overseas, something that's full art, which we do sometimes, that adds a lot of time to the time timetable. But generally, it's 12 to 24 months. And I want to touch on something real quick that you mentioned, uh, peer review, which just makes us different from other places. And, uh, you would obviously assume peer review is something common to scholarly books. But I wanted to ask Barbara, I'm curious, as a, as a poet, and poetry is not something you see as being a scholarly peer review subject, what was your experience with peer review? Uh, it was actually fantastic. I was um, at a residency in Central Oregon in the middle of nowhere when I got my uh, peer reviews. And it was truly the first time that strangers had remarked on this collection of poetry. And their input was incredibly invigorating. They made me believe in this book, and uh, yeah, I literally ran around for two days screaming <laughs> in joy. Because, you know, you write in isolation, and you may show the, the manuscript to all your closest, in my case, poet friends and mentors, and some of my mentors are extremely well-known folks in the country, but to have these complete strangers who didn't have any idea who Barbara Brockman was respond with incredible detail and uh, very specific comments about specific poems in this 85-page book was, uh, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of my knowing that I was on a journey and this was going to go out into the world, so it was really pretty great. I imagine this with me. I've sent in a proposal to UNM Press and you've offered me a contract. Okay. 
And I've sent the same proposal to Smith & Jones, let's say a mid-sized national publisher located in St. Louis, <clears throat> for profit. Taking into account different sizes, different budgets, number of staff, and so forth, I assume this book is sort of a potentially fairly popular nonfiction book on, say, conflicts between the Comanches and Navajos, or something about the Santa Fe Trail. Would you say your marketing program would differ substantially from that of the publisher in St. Louis, or would it be substantially the same? That's a great question. So for anyone who couldn't hear it, he's asking basically the difference between publishing uh, a book that would maybe be uh, more in our wheelhouse than the wheelhouse of a different publisher, um, weighing the pros and cons of publishing with us versus someone else, even if they're bigger and able to provide more our budget, uh, those kind of things. Um, so this is, uh, this is exactly the kind of situation that uh, UNM Press and presses like ours thrive on. And I uh, also want to take a moment to shout out all of the local publishers who are not just university publishers or UNM Press because places like SPD and Rio Grande and, and um, Swimming with Elephants and Nighthawk and all these other presses that are local, we all fill niches and we all fill needs and um, we all fill markets. And so for us, um, we have inroads that others may not because of our track record with publishing um, and specific subject areas and specific types of authors and types of books. So this is something I would encourage everyone to do when considering publishers to submit to is looking extensively at their backlog of uh, their, their backlist and seeing not just what they published last year uh, and the year before, but for the last decade, what books have they been publishing? Um, and is your book very similar to those books? And there's sort of a double-edged sword with that, which is that if your book is very similar to books they've published 15 of in the last three years, they may be exhausted of, from that. No, not, not like emotionally exhausted, but like they may have just like exhausted the market for that at the time. Um, I mean, we're never emotionally exhausted. Um, no, we, we just, we travel along. And, uh, but so, and so there is a double-edged sort of it where maybe they say like we published a very similar book to this last year and other similar, very similar books to it multiple times in the last few years and they may say it's not the right time for us to publish this even if it is the right fit for us. On the flip side of that, if it's within our wheelhouse, say um, Indigenous or Native Studies, um, something that is very important to you and press and something we publish extensively, um, we also have a very good understanding of what types of prizes and awards are right for that book because and that's another thing to look at too. Most publishers will have some sort of a, a list of like awards that they've won individually for different books. And so, if, if you know, for instance, like a specific prize that you is like the ideal prize for you, this book to win one day. I mean, obviously the Pulitzer, but like you know, like specific subject area uh, awards. Then you can say, okay, like they win this award very often. Like that's a good fit for my book. And. Um, so, yeah, and I think that the answer is, um, it's a judgment call, and if you are, if you want to work with a, a, a publisher that's experienced in what you want to do, I tend to lean that way. I've heard of a, of a, a pretty well-known poet who published with her second book with Knopf, and, or no, with FSG, and she moved there from a small printing press, and she said, oh great, I'm with FSG, this is like, the big leagues now. She was the bottom of their priority list, and she didn't win any of the, any major awards with that book. And she ended up leaving the press later because she she was just a, a second class citizen there um, because her book didn't sell as well as other FSG poetry titles. Um, so I mean, going with a big publisher that has a big name can sound great. It can also mean you're not going to get any attention. Um, and with smaller publishers like UNM Press, you're going to be able to call the office and like reach me or Catherine or Elise, uh, you're going to be able to talk to your editor if you're around here, if you can come to the office and talk to us, and that's great for a lot of people. Um, so I, I tend to lean toward, um, rather than a bigger place with a bigger budget, maybe that does feel right for you if you're able to, to land that, but the proven track record with a more personal touch is probably what I would lean toward if I had to really make a decision. So we have time for one more question. So the gentleman yeah. standing up, okay? I have two questions and one comment. 
why would a publisher want to be with you and your press? That's number one. Number two, if you sell my book for $25, how much goes to me? And my comment, having to wait 12 to 24 months to see my book and hold it in my hand, I believe is discouragingly long. Okay, and this is, these are also valid comments that, uh, valid concerns that a lot of people feel. And this is also why, where you publish as a judgment call. And you and I press isn't right for everybody because if you want your book to come out sooner than later, we have a peer review process, we have a protocol. It's going to take us a long time. That's how it works for the university presses. And what you get in exchange for that is the inroads that we have and the networks that we have. And if that's not important to you, if you feel well connected enough without the extension of ours, and a lot of people are, to be honest. People will self-publish or publish with small indies and publish thousands and thousands of copies of their book because they know how to do it. We publish the, the Writer's Portable Mentor was originally self-published. Uh, and that publisher published it herself. She created uh, a publisher for herself and for her, her book alone. She sold 8,000 copies of it or something by herself. Um, you know, people can do that. And if you want your book to come out fast, if you want control, that's another big thing. Is you might have a good say over um, like the cover of the book or different things like the layout or how you want the book to be treated, but you're never going to have full control whenever you work with a publisher. If you want to have full control, then the more personal self-publishing or publishing with a even smaller local indie is, is going to be important to you too. And, and again, also, um, we do have a royalty schedule, and that's going to be different in less than if you publish it yourself and you're getting all of the proceeds from the book or close to all the proceeds from every book you sell. So these are all valid concerns to think about. Good answers. Um, I'll also say, so some of the reasons you want to publish a book. Um, one of the factors is, is that you have support, um, say with UNM Press or other press publishers. We look at these as um, working as a team, it's a partnership, to get the book out, to make it beautiful, to get it into the reader's hands, whatever market is the best for that, that book. So you have um, publisher backing, you have people who are happy to help set up readings, which sometimes are hard to do, who'll take the book to exhibits um, that you might not think to take to. Um, you've got a publicist behind you who has inroads in terms of literary magazines, newspapers, um, radio stations that can try to get, they'll send out book review copies. Um, and one of the things that's nice about UNM Press and other presses, though it varies depending upon the press, um, is that they will submit the book to book awards. Um, every book that we publish, including the scholarly books, we look at certain number, we have a certain budget that we can put towards those book and say, okay, where do we think this book might fit in terms of uh, book awards? Uh, and we've got a number of books that have won Western Heritage Book Awards, uh, both scholarly and trade, uh, the Willow Award from the Women Writing the West, um, among many uh, 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 Pan American Book Awards, uh, Pan American Award uh, for Best Collection of Essays. There's a variety of things. So there's a support team behind that that can help you so that you, well, like I said, you are your own best publisher, more marketer, and you have to do the marketing, a lot of it yourself, but you still have a support team who's helping you do that. Um, and the other thing is that university presses in particular, but a lot of small presses are able to keep books um, in print for a lot longer than some other publishers. I mean, one of the things with the really large publishers is, as, as, as his friend found out at FSG, um, if it doesn't sell 10,000 uh, copies, you know, in the first year, they may not bring it out. If they took it in cloth, they're not going to bring it out into paper. And then they put it out of print faster. Whereas university presses and some small presses, they do smaller print runs, which luckily now with technology we can do. So instead of publishing and expecting to sell 10,000 copies, you know, I mean, which don't get me wrong, we do backflips. I mean, we'd love to get a book, you know, if it sells 10,000 copies in the first year. But for us, if we have a novel, and say it sells 1,500 to 2,500 copies in the first year, that's fantastic. And then a lot of that, then it goes down, so then we have to reprint. Then we can say, okay, we're gonna scale back. We're gonna publish 750 copies. We're gonna publish 500 copies. And we can continue to do small print runs and keep the book in print 
longer than um, some publishers might do otherwise, which means that it remains that your book is available both as a print book and as an e-book um, for a long time to come. It can be a strong backlist title, and, and we look both at our front list and our backlist because what we consider backlist titles, which are titles that came out in previous years, those continue to sell. They continue to make revenue. They continue to provide uh, royalties for authors and 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 monies for the press to keep the lights on. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for being here. This has been great. We hope to see you all again and come to the meetings if you like anytime. Um, I want to hear more about jazz poetry. <laughs> and uh, so thank you all.